today, we're going to go over the next steps to take in the optimization process if you're CPU bound. Let's go. So last week, we talked about analyzing your scene and how important it is to figure out where the bottleneck is before you start trying to optimize things. If you haven't seen the previous videos in the series, I've linked the playlist down below so that you can catch up. In your initial analysis of your scene, you're going to discover what the frame rate is, whether you're CPU or GPU bound, and also some key stats from the scene like the polygon count and the draw call count. With these bits of information, you'll be able to make a better decision about what needs optimizing. So today we're going to look at a couple of possible scenarios based on that information and I'll go over some things that you can do to improve your performance based on each situation. But first, I thought I'd give you a look ahead at where we're going with the video series. Behind the scenes, I've been working on optimizing two projects, one in Unreal and one in Unity. And these are the projects we're going to be using as our test cases. What I'd like to do is show you a before and after of these scenes so you can see the progress that I've been making in optimizing them. Now, one thing to keep in mind as we take a look at the performance of these scenes is that my machine is running an RTX 4080 graphics card, so the performance is gonna be pretty high. It would be a mistake to assume that these scenes will run this fast on the average PC or on a laptop, for example, I'm targeting pretty high numbers so that the performance will be decent on lower end hardware as well. So here's our Unreal scene that we've been taking a look at. And this is the original version. I haven't done anything to optimize this yet. And you can see taking a look at the stats up here in the upper right corner that it's running somewhere between uh, 63 and 65 frames a second which is pretty good. And here is the version of the scene that I've been optimizing. It looks about the same, but it's running at around 85 to 87 frames a second. So it's about a 25% performance improvement. And I'm hoping that I can find some additional ways of improving, improving it in the next couple of weeks. In future videos, we're going to do a deep dive into what I've done here, and I'll walk you through all of the optimizations and show you the problems I've found and the solutions that I've applied. All right, here's our Unity scene, and this unoptimized version runs at about 83 frames a second. And now let's switch over to the optimized version. And now we'll switch over to the optimized version and you can see that we're running at about 360 frames a second. Not bad. So again, later in the series, I'm going to show you the process of analyzing this scene and what I learned about it and then what I did to make it run faster. But before we get into the specifics of how I optimize these scenes, what I'd like to do is give you a series of general techniques that you can try on your scenes based on your analysis. As I've said before, every scene is different and it'll need different things to improve performance. I'd like to help you optimize your scene and not just show you how I optimize the ones that I'm working on. All right, so let's get into it. First, Let's look at what to do if your scene is CPU bound with a high number of draw calls. If draw calls are high and your CPU bound, you need to figure out how to reduce the draw calls so that the CPU doesn't need to do as much work. The brute force method of achieving this would be to just remove a whole bunch of objects from your scene. But there are some other methods that may be just as effective without drastically affecting the scene's appearance. The first thing to check is that instancing and batching are working correctly. To explain this a bit better, on this slide, the image of the road on the left represents the path 
that your data needs to take to get from the CPU to the GPU. And here's your empty moving truck ready to transport that data. One way to do this job would be to put one box on the truck, send it down the road, unload it, bring it back, and then put the next box on the truck. <laughs> but obviously that's going to be pretty slow. So what we want to do instead is load all of the boxes so that the truck is full and then send the whole thing all at once. That's how batching works. The game engine takes objects that need to be rendered and groups them together so that it can send them all at once instead of one at a time. Now instancing is similar but different. If you have multiple copies of objects in the scene like rocks, foliage, blades of grass, or lamp posts for example, check your engine settings to make sure that instancing is working. Instancing is a technique that engines use to reduce draw calls. Instead of sending each instance of an object as a separate draw call, the CPU just sends the object once and then it gets duplicated on the GPU. The image on the right side of this slide here is a good illustration of this idea. This is a wrench that was 3D printed on the International Space Station. If you need to get a set of 10 wrenches to the International Space Station, you could put them all on a rocket and launch them to get them there, but that's going to cost a lot. Instead, what we want to do is send the instructions to print the wrench to the station, and then we can print as many wrenches as we want. This is the same idea as instancing on the GPU. Most game engines do instancing and batching automatically, but it's always worth checking to make sure that it's working correctly. It can dramatically reduce draw calls and improve performance significantly. All right, let's talk about occlusion. When objects are behind other objects and not visible, the game engine needs to understand this and remove or skip the objects before they're rendered. Spending time rendering objects that aren't seen on the screen is a waste of resources and needs to be avoided. For example, if the camera is inside a building, objects that are outside of the building behind the walls shouldn't be drawn. Removing unseen objects before they're drawn is called occlusion culling. Each engine may have a different way to do this, but there are typically two ways to tell if it's working correctly. First, you just turn on wireframe mode. In wireframe mode, if you can see the wireframes of objects behind other objects, like through walls, for example, you know there's a problem with occlusion culling. And the second method is to freeze the game camera in place, but then move the viewport camera around. Occlusion culling will be done from the perspective of the game camera, but you'll be able to fly around with the viewport camera to see what is being drawn from the perspective of the game camera and what's being skipped. If you see a whole bunch of objects that are being drawn that you don't think should be drawn from that perspective, you may want to try to figure out how to improve your occlusion culling. Now, obviously, if occlusion culling is off, you'll want to enable it so that objects that aren't seen aren't being drawn. But be careful. Occlusion culling comes with a cost itself. So make sure that when you turn it on, it doesn't cost more performance than you're saving. Game engines often use special meshes or primitive shapes like boxes or spheres that are called occluders to make occlusion calling faster to calculate. You may be required to place these objects in your scene, like inside the walls or other meshes, for example, in order for occlusion calling to work. The more occluder objects you place, the more it will cost to calculate the occlusion so be as efficient as you can with the number of occluders that you place. Each game engine works a bit differently when it comes to occlusion, so be sure to read the documentation to understand the occlusion system in your engine. The way you lay out your level 
can influence the number of draw calls in a major way. If your level has sight lines that extend all the way across the map, or high points of view that allow the player to see everything in the level at once, you may run into trouble with draw calls. Consider laying out your level with choke points that block off some areas so that certain parts of the level are only visible in certain locations. This will allow you to turn off rendering of those areas when they're not in view. If you know that a large portion of the level is not in view, you can turn it off with a single trigger, and that's much cheaper to do than using occluders, and it'll give you a major reduction in draw calls for very little cost. Engines generally have a far distance at which everything stops drawing. But it's also possible to set some objects to stop drawing closer than that. If your scene has many small objects, these can be expensive to draw at a distance. And if objects are just a few pixels in size, they contribute very little to the image, but the CPU still has to spend the full amount of effort processing the draw calls for those objects. It may be worth changing the settings of those objects so that they clip out and stop drawing based on the percentage of their screen size. When objects fall below X percentage of the screen, they can clip out early and stop drawing so processing doesn't have to happen for those objects. All right, let's talk about HLODs. HLOD stands for Hierarchical Level of Details. An HLOD is a large group of meshes that has been baked into a single object. If your map design requires large vistas, for example, you can reduce the number of draw calls required for distant objects by grouping those objects and then baking them into HLODs. At a certain distance, the individual objects stop drawing as individuals and the game engine displays the single HLOD object instead, potentially converting hundreds of draw calls into just a single draw call. Creating HLOD objects can be a complex process, especially if your game engine doesn't have a built-in system for performing this task. So this option is often the last one considered for reducing draw calls after the others have not been enough to gain the needed optimization. Okay, let's sum this up. We've talked about instancing and batching, occlusion culling, level layout, early distance culling, and HLODs. These are all great methods of reducing the number of draw calls and can help if your draw call count is too high and your CPU bound. Now, you might be saying, how do I apply these specific techniques in my engine? Well, I'll show you more specific details for how to apply these principles in Unreal and Unity as we get into analyzing the scenes that I've been working on. But I wanted to go over the high level concepts in this video so that when I mention them in future videos, you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay, so I wanna talk briefly about what to do if you're CPU bound and your draw call count is low. This can happen when something other than graphics is the main bottleneck. Because graphics are so expensive on performance, this doesn't happen a lot, but it can happen. And when it does, it's usually caused by one of the items on this list or something similar. The game is doing something weird and asking the CPU to do a lot of extra work that it shouldn't. Generally, when this happens, it's time to talk to a programmer. If you can show that the game is running slow that you're CPU bound, and that draw calls are under budget, then your work as an artist is basically done, and your engineer needs to dive into this problem and figure it out. It's very likely that there's nothing you as an artist have done to cause this problem. All right, that about wraps it up for this video. Next week, I'm gonna do a similar format, but we'll be talking about what to do when you're GPU bound. And then, once we've covered all of these general principles, 
we're going to break out the GPU analyzer software in a couple of weeks and I'll show you how to break down your scene and get really specific with optimizations. Thanks a lot for coming with me on this optimization ride. See you next week.